I'm in there. Yes, sir. What's up, man? Holy shit. Where where are you right now with the the uh the the greenery background Connor culture? So this is your place. Yes, yes, Connor Culture Studios, man. Hell yeah, I love it. Between you and M and Royce, like you're just, you know, monopolizing the uh the the Detroit businesses. I love it. Love, love, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm just getting it started, man. Connor Culture, uh just you know, well, we ain't record. Are, is this the interview yet or no? I mean, I, I was going to cold open with this. So, like, it can be. Oh, well, yeah, but kind of culture is because I didn't know if you, you wanted to get want me getting a deep dive about it or uh, if we was recording. Oh, yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. You know what? Fuck it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a uh, four time soul radio guest, rapper, um, entrepreneur, writer. John Connor, thank you for uh, you know blessing me with your time again. Uh, it is always a pleasure talking to you. So yeah, you are in a in the studio Connor culture. You got this awesome background and neon sign behind you. Yeah, so yeah, with, yes, uh, indeed. His uh, his album three is available now on all streaming platforms. You can even buy the fucking hat if you want. Yes. And they can even buy the People's Rapper shirt I got on. Oh, and... absolutely. There you go. We got all the merch on display. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, uh, I know you saw this because you posted about it, but, you know, I'll do uh, I'll do commentating on TMZ Live every so often. And so they are always huge about, like, don't advertise anything when you're on the show. Like uh -huh. if, if you have your own if you have your own shit and there's like, you know, an Instagram handle or whatever, you cannot show it. And so the time before that, Harvey gave me attitude. So I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to throw this fucking hat on. The people who know will know. <laughs> well, man, thank you so much. When I seen that, man, I was so grateful and humbled, man. Thank you so much for for holding me down while you was doing your thing, man. I really appreciate it. Always. Thank you for coming on. Like, you never have to. And I always seem to manage to find time. So that's, you know, it's it's an absolute honor. Listen, bro, it's love for life. Whenever you want me on, I'm on, man. So tell me about this studio. What's going on with this? For the people well, yeah, with... Connor Culture Studio, man. Um, You know, it was pretty much basically, um, I was, I don't, I don't want to, I didn't want to have to wait for platforms to uh to for me to have to go to certain platforms. I'm like, why don't I just create all of these platforms? You know what I'm saying? And I was like, you know what? Um my my project three is still doing pretty good. Thank you to everybody who's supporting it. But it was just like, you know what? I want to invest back into myself just like I did with the music part of my career. It was like I always wanted to be a content provider. I always wanted to, you know, uh, express myself in more than just the musical aspect and then tell my story. So it's like I don't want to and no, no disrespect to these platforms, but it was like, you know, I don't want to wait to have to go to like a Vlad TV. I'll just create my own background, get some cameras and tell my own story. Or I don't want to have to wait until, or to go to a, uh, you know, what just whatever, uh, Drink Champs or a Breakfast Club. It's like, I'll just create my own platform and the people that are interested in me and my story, I'll give them, you know, all of that, you know, uh, on my own terms. So I can pretty much, you know, be in control of my narrative and how my story is told. Because I think a lot of times there's a lot of things about my journey that people don't know that I wish they did know. So it's like, you know what? I'll just create my own studio and I'll tell my story in creative it. ways, man. Well, congratulations. So Thank this you. so this to be clear, like you're you're gonna be creating content and not like just music. This is gonna be well, like right. a video blogs. Yeah, pretty much. You know what? It, it's gonna be a Every aspect of my personality, I'm turning that into a show or some form of content. It's like uh, people um, oftentimes ask me about like uh, maybe the aftermath portion of my journey, right? Like they'll ask me questions about like uh, what was it like working with Dre or whatever the case may be. You know, it's six. That was like six, seven years of my life. So there are so many stories that I have to tell that I feel like people only know what they know. So they don't know to ask me about certain things. So it's like, I'll put the information out there. You know what I'm saying? I'll, 
you know, you know, do that. Or I'll talk about just my beginnings or there's so much that I've learned just about the business part of show business that I'm even going to have a show where I call it Industry Etiquette 101, where I just do you know, content where I teach young and up and coming artists, like, look out for this, watch out for this. Don't, you know, just those type of things. So there's going to be like a lot of different shows. Connor culture is going to be a, a, um, you know, just a bunch of different ideas that I've always had in my head for just shows and content and expressing myself. So yeah, Connor culture, man, it's going to be cool. It's going to, it's going to let people into my entire world, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm I'm very much excited to see that. And shit, next time in Detroit, I, I have like a standing like when he's putting out something and when I'm able to make it out to town interview nailed down with Royce. And we're going to be talking about Heaven Studios, which is the one that he opened. I'm going to have to come by and visit you, too. Yeah. Come on through. Connor caught you. Like we could do an interview in the studio. It's yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's not like it's a. I got a couple different sets for my different shows. I got um my set where I'm gonna talk about pro wrestling because I'm a big pro wrestling fan. Nice. Then, um, yeah, you can't see it, but it's like a bunch of. There's a set over here, a set over there, one over there, one behind me. So it's just it's it's really cool, man. I can't That's wait. That's fucking to, awesome, uh, dude. Yeah, man, I can't wait to to uh, get it popping, man. Well, I you know. I always use what's going on in your background to have like extensive Batman conversations with you, but I guess I don't get to do that <laughs> this time. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about your album three, which is comparatively like leaps and bounds more personal as a project that you've put out before. And probably the most like, I, I just like sonically consistent in terms of production with the soul samples and the narrative. And uh, yeah, it, I, I've noticed a pattern of like rappers when they get a little older, have a little more experience, even if they were just known for being a spitter before, you know, they, you know, get into more, uh, you know, personal territory as they become more introspective, like your 444s, your Book of Ryan's, your uh, Life is Good. So, uh, why now in your career to make that kind of project? Um, I think my projects are always a reflection of where I am in my life, you know? And um, I think that three was the perfect um, representation for where I am mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all those things. And I just think that um, three was just a reflection of where I am. You know, I uh, I think that um, I had like a, a spiritual uh, awakening as far as like me understanding my relationship to God and the world and my purpose and all of those things. And it almost started to feel like, you know, that's that's what I need to express. Like, what else is there to express? Like, that's such a big, you know, leap from where I was at in my last project. So I just wanted to, um, as always, that's why I call myself the people's rapper. Just I want the people to feel like they have that personal connection with me to know where I'm at in my life beyond just rhymes and bars. Yeah. And so with this project, it was like, yeah, let's do it. I'm, I'm going all in. I'm going I'm to express what, where I am. So three is just a reflection of where I really am in my real life. And this might be my favorite project of yours uh, to date. Thank you. For that reason. Thank because you. It, it, it touches so many like human, like it, doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, who you know, it, it touches on just the universal human emotions and experiences, uh, loss, heartbreak, regret, you know, introspection. And, and that's the thing I appreciated the most. And, you know, you brought up, uh, you brought up earlier in the interview, part of why you started the studio was uh, to get have people get to know you more beyond like the years you were with Aftermath. And you even have that skit in the album of the interviewer just being like, what was it like being signed up to Dr. Dre? Did you meet Eminem? And part of me was just like, fuck, I asked both of those questions the first time I interviewed him. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Your heart was in the right place. Some other people's hearts aren't in the right place. 
I at least knew your career beforehand. So like yeah. that wasn't the only two questions. I just, you know, had to cover all the bases. But is this a deliberate attempt to get people to know you beyond those years and to kind of like relate to what you went through then and who you are as a person now in comparison? Well, yeah, I think so in, in a lot of ways. Because, uh, well, a couple of things I would want to say about that is, for one, I don't I don't hate talking about that time period of my life. It's a part of my life. That's like, so sorry, Polly, shut up. Come here. <laughs> Weirdo. He always waits until I'm either on the phone or interviewing someone. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I don't, I, I don't. Guys, knock it off. Come here. Whoa, whoa. Too they all riled up. up. Lulu, hey, get back here. Lay down. God damn it, dog. They always try to make the podcast about themselves. It's all good. It's all good. I'm sorry. Go on. No, it was like uh, what I was saying was I don't hate talking about that portion of my life because life is life. And any experience that I've been through, hopefully people can use it, take it and grow from it and, and uh, apply it to their life or whatever the case may be. And it's like when people ask me about the years I was on Aftermath, I, it's like the years that I was in high school or something. It happened, yeah. you know, that it's just like I, I had good memories in high school. I got bad memories from high school. I got good memories from the Aftermath years. I got bad memories from the Aftermath years. And then in the time period after that and so on and so forth. But it's like for me, it's like. It just felt like, let me, if y'all want to know, if people want to know more about that time period of my life, I'll feed them some more information so the questions don't have to be so repetitive, you know, because they become very, very repetitive. So it's like, you know what, let me just put my story out there so that, you know, if we're going to talk about it, let's talk about everything and let's, you know, let's, let's not keep having the same conversations over and over again. So yeah, yeah, I think that counterculture is definitely uh, a way for me to embrace that part of my life as well. Not that I shun it or anything, but it's like um, embracing it so that I can give more to the world. Because I think a lot of times people are confused. Like they'll say, well, why didn't the project come out? What happened? What, what you know what I'm saying? So it's like, mm -hmm. I want to give people more insight as to what my everyday life was like during that time period, the people that I was around, um, the scenario, the different scenarios between management and label and this and that. It's like, because in, in like interviews like this, where it's only for so long, there's only so much information that I can give. And there's only so long that we can stay on each individual topic. Right. So yeah. it's like with counterculture, it's like, I can tell it all. And then, then maybe you'll watch an episode on counterculture and that'll give you more ideas like, yo, well, you said this happened. What was it like when this happened? So it'll just, like I said, give people a more well-rounded um, idea of what that time period of my life was like. And also just who I am as a person, because that's not all it's going to be about. We're going to talk about my career before that, during that, after that, mm -hmm. the right now, the rebuilding, the counterculture portion of my life. Um, just all of these ideas. And I just want to give people, like I said, more insight as to who I am as a person. And also for journalists like yourself, just giving y'all more of um, a broader perspective of what those years of my life were like. And I think that's what people forget is that artists and people who are public figures are in fact human beings at the end of the day. And they're not defined by a certain accomplishment or a time period. And it can get incredibly frustrating to you know your whole life is boiled down to this one thing you know, what was the biggest adjustment becoming an independent artist uh yeah. after the major label thing uh the biggest adjustment after because right because my journey was independent major then back to independent um the may the biggest adjustment will probably be uh how how quick people change up you know people you thought was friends you stop hearing from them you know what i'm saying and you literally have to pick up and rebuild because the perception when you leave a major label uh for the most part is 
um, because a lot of people, when you're an artist, they're looking at you as an opportunity. They're looking at you like to get on that free ride to the gravy train. You know what I'm saying? So when you leave a major label, like the people around you, like it tests their friendship. It tests their loyalty. You know what I'm saying? The biggest adjustment, I guess, would basically be, mm, that's kind of a tough question because I think in my situation at Aftermath, I didn't get like, uh, I didn't get like uh, the superstar package. You know what I'm saying? Like I was signed to a major, but it ain't like the, as soon as I got signed the next day, y'all seen big billboards with John Connor on it or, you know what I'm saying? You seen me on every TV show. So it was almost like I was still independent while I was on Aftermath. So that's why I guess that question is kind of difficult because it's like, yeah. was there really a big change? The only the biggest adjustment was when I was on Aftermath, there was a lot of a lot of people who had opinions and that um, had power over my life and my career. And then mm. once I left, it was the 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 biggest transition, which was cool for me, is that I was back in control of my life. I was back You're in just control. Not bogged down by industry politics anymore. Exactly. And that that to me is a beautiful thing to not be bound by industry politics no more. So, you know, I think the biggest adjustment and, and I think, too, I, I just check myself because when people ask the question, like when they say biggest adjustment, it's almost being asked as if the adjustment is like uh, something was difficult. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. But, and it doesn't need to be that. Yeah. And in this moment, that's what I'm saying, like the adjustment was actually something that was good was that I had all of that weight off of me, you know what I'm saying, of dealing with the politics and the political aspect of, of show business. So it was just back on me, doing everything myself, trusting in myself, mm -hmm. believing in myself, making my own decisions. So the biggest adjustment uh, wasn't difficult at all. It was actually like a huge weight off of me. That's great. Yeah, and it, it also kind of taught you like, you know, because you said before you were independent first, and I first heard of you when you were still independent, like during the blog era. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I told you before, the first thing I ever heard from you was that uh, John Legend freestyle. The another again freestyle, because like Case Play played it on a Thursday night show. Guys, I swear to God. Get your asses over here, asshole. <laughs> Christ, they were quiet all day. <laughs> I'm so it's sorry. all good. They just want a little bit of love. It's all I good. know. Look, look at this. Like, they just want a little bit of love. That's it. You act like I don't give you attention. <laughs> that hat is fresh, though, man. I'm gonna have to get. Thank you. I gotta get one of those. I know, right? No, it's uh, my my rapper friend has has a store online. This is like to promote an album. But then, like, you know, if you look it up, you can find it. And then the album itself is pretty damn good, too. Hey, I'm going to I'm gonna have to check into it. I got I got the uh, the dad hat version of the three hat. I want you got the, the baseball cap version. I want that version. There you go. But yeah, yeah, but hey, yeah I, but... I have enough dad hats where I was just like, I need to switch it up and, you know, not look like I'm 36 years old, which I am. But... <laughs> I'm embracing it, man. I just turned 39, man. So I'm embracing but, it. Yeah, what what are you gonna do for the big 4 L? Man, I don't know. Lord willing, I'm financially blessed enough to be on some type of boat somewhere in nice. a tropical environment, relaxing, kicking my <laughs> feet up with my chest hairs out and some white shorts on and some and, and, and some sandals. There you go. Just go full like middle aged dad on it. Like you have yes. the cargo shorts. Yes. You have like twelve hours of Steely Dan playing in the background. Come on now, let's go. Get yes. that Hey Nineteen going, bro. That sound like heaven to <laughs> me, man. Put on some Sade, sweetest taboo. There you go. That's a better chill. option. <laughs> no, That's I love Steely Dan better too. Option. The, um, so I reached out to you a couple of days after I watched this live stream uh, between you and I forget the other individual, but you guys were talking about the Drake and Kendrick beef, uh, which is all over Akeem the Internet Woods. right now. What's up? Comedian Akeem Woods. OK, what's up? Shout out to Akeem Woods. I will check yep, out your that's comedy. That's who I was there. on live with. 
you know, and I don't know, there's been a lot said about it. And I, I believe that your attitude toward the whole thing was ultimately this was good for the fan. This was good for the culture. There have been other, you know, uh, renowned artists such as like Questlove who say that, you know, hip hop is officially dead because of this because shit got too personal. What What is your response to that perception? Um, I respect Questlove and um my my opinion on it um has nothing to do with his opinion on it i respect him everybody yeah. entitled to, you know oh yeah that's not what i was trying to say oh for sure i just you know i just have to clarify because people will take stuff and run with it but um um i feel like nobody got hurt in the process i feel mm -hmm. like i feel like also two things can be true at the same time Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, uh, two things can be true at the same time. I think that it was they put on a hell of a show. I think that hip hop was, you know, that's always been a part of the culture is battling. You know what I'm saying? Um, and in that respect, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I think that uh, the fact that people's family members and children got involved that was a little much. That was you know. Much. Yeah, because we got to think at the end of the day, like you said about me, it's like Kendrick Lamar and Drake, they're human at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And they, their loved ones will still have to deal with the after effects of the things that were said in these records. Oh, yeah, that poor kid. Yeah, you know, all, both of their kids, you know, yeah. one person getting accused of being a, a, a pedo and the other one ac accused of domestically abusing his wife you know what i'm saying it's like those were heavy accusations so it's like i think like i said two things can be true at the same time one it was good for hip-hop because drake and uh kendrick had like the number one two three well i like one through six slots on apple music and billboard mm -hmm. like for drake and kendrick lamar which was cool for hip-hop and also the excitement you couldn't wait to hear these raps that they were coming out with. But also, it was unfortunate that it got taken to the level that it did because yeah. they're even saying now that it um it kind of affected Drake's deal with Nike. And um okay, now, man. yeah, now Drake kind of got this stigma on him, whether who knows if it's true or not. And, and then and then Kendrick Lamar kind of has a stigma on him. Who knows whether that's true or not? But the on the bad side, they both came out of the battle with the public looking at them differently you know yeah. what i'm saying so you know i think that uh, on the one hand it was good for hip-hop because they did numbers and people were excited about it but at the same time i think that the level of how personal it got wasn't good for anybody beyond just kendrick and drake their families and everything too yeah and my the the issue I took, and again, like much respect to Questlove, I met him like 10 years ago and he was the nicest human being. Mm -hmm. uh, what I disagree with what he said, I don't think hip hop is particularly dead or even changed that much because it got as personal as it did. Like it, to say that is to say like one of the most renowned diss tracks of all time didn't start with I, that's why I fucked your bitch you fat motherfucker <laughs> right or right. like you know Jay Z wasn't rapping about like fucking Nas's you know the mother of his child like this has happened before and it's it's probably not right depending on who you ask but it's also not new and it's not going to shift one of the most like prominent genres of all time in the way that he's implying it is that that that's my take it, on it yeah trust me it, well the way i feel it's a million other things killing hip-hop and drake and kendrick lamar to me is not even on the top 10 of things no. that are killing hip-hop i could name a million other things that's killing hip-hop you know, besides Drake and Kendrick Lamar, I think the lack of gatekeepers, the allowance mm -hmm. of the the fact that there is no um, there's no um, there's no really no standard anymore. Like there's no like think about like I feel like the way hip hop is right now is uh like you know at least in like sports you got to try out 
in order to be involved. I feel like in hip hop, there are no tryouts anymore. You can just come off the street and just be a rapper. And, you mm -hmm. know, that's what it is. And I feel like there's no quality control in hip hop anymore. I feel like um, we make excuses um, for things. As long as it's making us money, we'll make excuses that excuse us from being morally uh, responsible. You know what I'm saying? And I feel I, like when I get on my like when I get on YouTube and I get on there and the, the suggested videos like for the rap shit is crazy. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's so much terrible, trash, poisonous, counterproductive music in the world right now that it don't make no sense. So I can't even say that Drake and Kendrick Lamar is killing hip hop or hip hop is dead because of that. It's a lot of other shit did. we should be we should be upset about, you know what I'm saying? Uh besides Kendrick versus Drake in, in regards to the well being of hip hop. Yeah, there's there's a lot of other damaging shit. And you bring up gatekeepers and it, it's it's a combination of the lack of gatekeepers and then the ones that we have are more of them are compromised than not compromised. I agree. I agree. I remember I had a, a a meeting with an executive one time and he was playing me the most terrible shit I ever heard in my life. And he thought it was the greatest shit ever. Like, you know what I'm saying? He was jumping up and down like, yo, this is about to be crazy. And I remember just looking at him like, bro, you are contributing to the downfall of your own people, mm -hmm. your own culture. And you doing it because you're getting a check. And just for me, um, all money ain't good money and everything ain't ain't worth ain't worth it so i just i've never respected people like that um i don't respect uh people who will contribute to the downfall of the culture for a check it's just whack and i think that there's a lot of that going on now yeah no fuck academics uh <laughs> yeah. no i mean you know i'm like i'm from chicago so that's been my attitude for fucking years because he got to start with that bullshit chirac channel Ah, but, that's uh, right. That's right. OK. Yep. And so like when he was essentially getting payola from Drake to hype him up with the platform he had, I'm like, yeah, no, this doesn't shock me at all. Mm. And I don't know. I feel like I wish there were more influencers with that kind of a platform that were able to keep it more objective. In terms of both quality and, you know, cultural impact, like. Say what you will about Joe Button, but I think he's one of the best, you know, personalities out there doing it because of, like, you know, all the people he's feuded with in the past. Right. But to his credit, when their names come up in the news, he doesn't let that shit get in the way of what his opinion is going to be. Like right. that part I really respect about him. Absolutely. And I think it's cool that on Joe Budden's podcast, there are like three, four or five other people on there with him that are giving a uh, counter perspective uh, when they don't agree with something that he says. Mm -hmm. So it's like a very well-rounded um, platform when it comes to like opinions and objectives and motives and all of that. It's like, you know, five other people that's there like that don't necessarily all the time agree with Joe. So I think that overall, that's a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think I thought Rory and Maul were great when they were there. Uh, yeah. I think it's has really taken a top spot. I love that Melissa Ford is a regular on it now. Absolutely. And she kind of brings in that like on the set, not an artist, but I was around artists all the time during the golden age kind of perspective and she offers like a really unique take on certain things like it's, it and i i feel like that's just how you should keep your life like what point is there just living in an echo chamber you're never going to evolve that way that's a very yeah. uh shit so how long has counterculture been going on i i feel like i just completely missed out on it well no nah, i haven't even launched it yet but i've okay, had the good. ideas and the rumblings of it since I was, since about 2016, 17. And I used to tell like the people around me at the time, like, yo, I want to be a, I want to be a content provider before they even really knew what the fuck that meant. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, I just want to make and create content. I'm like, if I have an opinion about something, I want to talk about it. If I have an idea for just like a short 
uh, like skit or something like that. I want to be able to do it if I want to talk about wrestling, if I want to talk about movies. And they kind of didn't understand like where I was going with it. So now I'm able to just do it. So the idea has been in my brain since about 2015, 2016. Okay. So now I'm just able to execute it now, and it's it's gonna be fun. I'm looking forward to it, man. Are there any podcasts or YouTubers or you know any kind of short form content that you're consuming now that's influencing what you're making behind the scenes? I watch everything from uh, from Candace Owens to Drink Champs to Eighty Five South to uh, um. What else do I watch? Uh, Joe Budden podcast, uh, academics, like just to see uh, Art of Dialogue, Vlad TV. Um, Charlemagne and this one cat got one too that I, I watch. Oh, uh, the Brilliant Idiots. Yeah, Brilliant Idiots. Um, I watch uh, pro wrestling podcasts like Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard and Conrad Thompson. Uh, nice. I watch 84 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. I watch... Uh, what else do I watch? Uh, oh, uh, Keeping It 100 with Conan and Disco Inferno. So I watch all of these and I'm like, you know what? Um, I want to, it's like, I want to take a little bit of some of everything and incorporate that into my own thing, man. So I just been watching, just studying, like, what is it that makes me enjoy these particular shows? You know, what is it that keeps me tuning into it? So I watch a little bit of everything, man. I'm I'm a student of the game now. Since I'm I'm jumping in the content game, I gotta make sure I I check out the market and see what's going on. So I watch a little bit of everything. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell me about your relationship with wrestling. I didn't even know that that was an interest of yours. The closest I came was like I played the old WWF, uh, like. PlayStation One games, yeah, like fucking Warzone, where you could play as like Owen Hart and Gold Dust, and it was yeah. like Free the Rock, like Stone Cold Steve Austin was still the headliner for everything. Yes, yes, yes. I remember that game. I bought War. I had Warzone on PlayStation One. I Fuck did, it. but yeah, that is so crazy because yeah, bro, uh, movies, music, and pro wrestling were the things that I was always the most passionate about like my entire life and like I said I got the Cody Rhodes hat on right now you know what I'm saying like I man um I probably there I'm probably equally as passionate about pro wrestling as I am music because I think I fell in love with pro wrestling before I ever decided that I wanted to be a musician you know what I'm saying and I always just watched and studied I think pro wrestling is probably one of the most beautiful forms of entertainment it's a dope way of storytelling and it's heroes versus villains it's uh the best of everything the best of music and um the best of uh charisma and showing that you got personality and knowing how to captivate a crowd it's like it's just a beautiful thing so movies music and pro wrestling have always been my three loves man and the common denominator for all three of those things is yeah like a the storytelling and b just like the theater involved Yes. So I, I, you know, I, I'm not an enthusiast to wrestling myself, but I still get fucking annoyed with anyone who's like, you know, that shit isn't real, right? Whereas, like, those same people will go in about, you know, certain rap beefs and be like, you know, like half of the shit was manufactured to drive engagement. Like, yeah, it's or literally even, bro, the same thing. You just like even, one thing and you don't like the other thing. It's the same way I feel about people that watch reality television. I look at yeah. them like, you know, that's fake, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And it's funny. I was telling a friend of mine that I'm like, it's so funny to me that all my life people would say that about people that watch pro wrestling. Like, you know, it's fake. And now I watch the world like believe like believe like the majority of the garbage that's on the Internet and on TV, eat from politics to reality television. I'm like. All of this shit is pro wrestling. Pro wrestling right. is just very honest about what it is. You know what I'm Satire saying? Satire is absolutely dead. <laughs> huh? Satire is fucking dead now. Yeah, man. You feel me? So, yeah. you know, that's the way I look at it. The world is pro wrestling. And the and, and it's like they're getting, you know, nobody gets that this is all just a show. It's all just show business, man. So I love pro wrestling. And so and yeah. I seen uh, there's a legendary manager, God rest his soul, Bobby the Brain Heenan. He said one time, he said, uh, he said, it's funny that people say 
hey, you know, wrestling's fake. He said, we never tried to convince you that it was real. He was like, you know what I'm saying? He was like, it's a show. Now, the action yeah. that happens in the ring, you can't fucking slam somebody on the mat and think that they that it doesn't hurt. It does. Yeah. It's like, you know what I'm saying? You can't do the things that they do and not get hurt. Now, are they trying to kill each other? No. But to say pro wrestling is fake is ridiculous. There's nothing fake about getting hit with a chair or jumping yeah. off the ropes and somebody, that body, a grown man landing on you. It's going to hurt. Now, are they trying to kill each other? No. But that's why I think it's one of the greatest forms of entertainment. You know what I'm saying? 100%. It's uh, the, the fact that, you know, these two people can get in the ring and they both know who's going to win and who's going to lose. But they can captivate thousands of people and make us suspend our disbelief and take us on that roller coaster ride and make us believe that they don't know. Like that's that's it's, it's like watching a movie in real life. It's like a live action movie or something. Yeah, it's like it's like going to see the Harlem Globetrotters. Like, you know, the Washington Generals are going to get their asses handed to them. <laughs> but it, it's all about the journey to getting there. And you know, that, that takes skill. That's a fact. 100%. I got nothing but respect for pro wrestlers, man. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Well, shit, I'll just send you pictures in July when I'm there. Uh, hey, please do. Were you at NWA when uh, my man, uh, well, I never met him before, but I'm a huge fan of L.A. Knight, Eli Drake? I have heard the name. I, I wasn't at any of the events. I organized a bunch of their merchandise, like, overnight one night, and that was about as far as it goes, like, Billy and his wife, Chloe, knew that I just, like, had zero knowledge and I was just there to do my job. I would have music conversations with him all day, but, like, wrestling, like, he tried maybe twice and I, both times I was just, like, uh, and I think he just gave up. But, uh, but so this is going to be my first time going there and I'm just going to, like, bum rush him. I haven't really seen him in, like, a year. Yeah. But, well, uh, man, enjoy yourself. You're going to have a ball, man. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah, the um, I did meet. He died a few years too. Uh, Josephus, tall dude, long beard. Um, I don't, I don't. He was involved in NWA. I, I don't know. He died of like cancer maybe three years ago. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I met him at at an event. Uh, you know, further back than that. Mm, God bless. God bless. God rest his soul. Um. All right, John, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come and be out here. You are now tied with Busy Bone for a rapper who has been on the podcast the most time. <laughs> That's love. Me You're and in Busy good company. Got a Yo, me and Busy got a version of For the Love of Money that never came out. I think it's still what? Mike. Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm seeing him in two weeks. I'm going to bug him for it. That's funny. He probably got it. And tell... I think uh, we got a mutual friend named DJ Silk um, who probably actually has the record. But yeah, yeah, he'll know yeah. what I'm talking about. The For the Love of Money remix with him and John Connor. And it never it never dropped. Like, it's still somewhere in somebody's, excuse me, in somebody's hard drive. But so, so, that his so manager, August Keen, knows where it is. That man is way too organized. <laughs> well, yeah, man. If, if he remember it, that's going to be funny as shit. Definitely bring it up to him. I will bring it up to him and report back. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, man, it's always a pleasure, man. Anytime you want me on here, I'm here, man. And thank I you for letting you put the word out about counterculture and what I got going on. And oh, yeah. the album three, man. Make sure y'all check it out. And the hats, most importantly, you know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Put our priorities out. Uh, yeah, is there anything get, you want to plug before merch. you go? Huh? Anything you want to plug before you go? Um, just anybody watching this right now, um, if you're familiar with me, my music and all of that, man, please stay tuned. Connor Culture TV is on the way. Um, my project three is out right now. Uh, I'm trying to drop another joint called Food for the Soul in June, uh, just to hit y'all back to back with some dope shit. And, uh, please go to counterculture.com right now. Go get that dope hat right there you can go get this shirt there's a whole bunch more merch on there man make sure y'all go support independent artists even if it ain't me go support your favorite independent artists because without y'all the people what we do means nothing so that's it man thank you it's for the community me, thing god damn it yes all right john thank you so much 
Say hi to Lindsay for me. Absolutely. Much love to you. All right, love, bro. I have a good one. You too, man. Peace. <laughs>